What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 25 of Preloaded. My name is Josh Finderup, and I'm joined, as always, by the other half of Preloaded, Jackson Van Over. How are you doing, Jackson? I'm doing great, Josh. Not a lot of new games out lately, but we've got some exciting news to talk about. Yeah, we got a huge release date announced this morning, just this morning. We got some very interesting Bioware news, and we got a huge, this doesn't sound exciting, but we got a huge uh, news drop uh, from the Ubisoft earnings call. Uh, And there is, believe it or not, some really interesting stuff in there. So you want to stay tuned for all of that. But first, preloaded posts every Friday. We post on both of our YouTube channels. I'm Quest Mode on YouTube, and Jackson is JV, J-A-Y-V, double E. But if you prefer the audio version of the podcast, you can catch that over on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And if you are listening on any of those platforms, we'd love for you to leave a review. If you're enjoying the show, drop a five-star review or even a written review. You can also write into Preloaded at the email address preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And we welcome all of your feedback, your comments, but we'd really love to get your questions. At the end of every show, we pick one of your questions to discuss right here. So if there's anything you want to hear us uh, dig into, send us an email. It's preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And we'll look forward to reading all of your messages. We do read them all and we appreciate them very much. To kick the show off, we are going to talk a little bit about what we've been playing. In fact, this segment is called, What the Hell Have You Been Playing? Jackson, I'll kick it over to you. (laughs) All right, Josh. So for me, um, as you guys know, I play a lot of AC games. So Origins is something I've been diving back into. And yeah, just still really enjoying that game. Um, But the one that I played most recently that is big in my mind is Valheim. And this has gotten a lot of like... Uh, hype, I would say. It's sold a million copies on Steam already. Um, It's basically a Viking-themed survival game, Um, and it's very, like, low-res, pixelated kind of art style, almost like Minecraft, and I I usually do not like survival games at all, but this one, for some reason, has hooked me. It's just really chill. Uh, It's got a great vibe, great energy, and I definitely recommend you guys check it out if you're looking for something to play during this drought of games. What sparked your interest in this game? <laughs> you you might say it's the Viking theme. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. Like it, people comparing it to Valhalla. Um, they have similar names, similar themes. So that was the initial thing. But also just word of mouth. People saying it's a good game. Yeah, yeah. I saw your tweet when you said, "All right, you got me." And uh, so <laughs> cool to hear you're enjoying it. Well. I uh, finally finished Hitman 3. Uh, I nice. did uh, as planned. I went through each mission very meticulously and uh, got all the uh, the masteries or achieved all the masteries, whatever you want to call it, and uh, just totally fell in love with that game. I definitely plan on uh, returning to it to play some of the Escalation missions and check out the um, the content drops that IO has planned for that. Just it, This is without a doubt going to be one of my top games of the year. Uh, if, again, if it's not, that means 2021 will be amazing. And it got me, <laughs> I, I was so into it that it got me just fascinated with stealth games. And I've just been consuming all this content on YouTube about stealth games and it made me want to go back and just play some of the games that I either haven't played or in the genre that I haven't played or that I maybe didn't like when I first played them. So I started with Tenchu. I went all the way back uh, to the PS1 days and fired up Tenchu, Tenchu 2. And also on my PS2, I played, uh, it's called Tenchu Wrath of Heaven, I think is the name of the game. It's like the third in the series. Okay. And uh, um, I I won't play any of these all the way through, but it was very interesting to see kind of where the stealth genre. I mean, I've played the original Metal Gear and I've played some other games that are older, but these are ones that I, I own and I just, in my retro collection and just never got to them. And I can see the influences, you know, how Tenchu helps you keep track of your enemies that are on the screen. I can see how that kind of influenced games coming forward, but the stealth mechanics are so basic, and they're they especially in the PlayStation One games, they just don't work very well. So, <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is, you know, uh, From Software bought the rights to Tenchu, and I can see where they were um, 
uh, draw, why they were drawn to this series. It's very Souls-like. You know, it's very challenging. Each enemy can provide quite the challenge, just like in the Souls games. Bosses are tough as nails, and you don't get a chance to save before you fight them. So very interesting to see just kind of the influences that this series had. That's awesome. I've heard of Tenchu, but never played them. And um, I actually watched a video. I think it was like counting down the best sword fighting games. Mm -hmm. And one of those was a Tenchu game. I can't remember which one. But um, yeah, they just kind of cited that as one of the classic examples of a great sword combat system. Yeah, yeah, it it does, uh, especially for the time. I mean, nowadays, not so much, but for when (laughs) it came out, definitely uh, an influential and, and good game. So uh, I'll probably have more stealth games to report back on next week. Yes, I can't wait to hear. I really want it. I really want you to beat a Dishonored game because I would just talk about that all podcast long. I'm 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 weighing. Do I finish Dishonored one? But I've been, having watched all this stealth game content. I've been watching some on Dishonored two, and the game looks so good. I just want to uh, get into that one instead of the first one. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, I wouldn't say you have to beat the first one, but man, Dishonored two is so underrated. Um, yeah. I don't know why people don't talk about it more yeah stealth games i just don't think they get the love uh, yeah unfortunately I'm with you. so anyways that is what we've been playing we're now going to dig right into the news uh we're going to look at our top headlines of the week or no breaking news i'm still getting used to this new format this is breaking <laughs> news so we we actually have some like literal breaking news this morning uh ratchet and clank Rift Apart for the PS5 got its release date. They also dropped a new trailer, Sony did, and this game is coming out June 11th. So mark your calendars. I really hope that everybody who wants a PS5 can get one by the time this game comes out. Hopefully the shortages are um, over by then, but we will see. We also got a... Oh, I was just going to say real quick, um, they've really stretched the idea of the launch window for this game. I know know COVID's (laughs) a reality, and I'm sure that was a big part of it, but man... We thought this game was going to come out last year, so this is kind of wild. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a like an eight or nine month release window, so um, <laughs> it's kind of bizarre. Um, next, EA dropped a very, I don't know if they dropped this story, but it kind of got out into the wild that BioWare is kind of on the chopping block, potentially, that the executives at EA are going to hold a meeting this week, apparently, so this may have happened by the time you're listening to this, where they are going to decide whether or not to reboot the franchise or scrap it all together. And so, uh, you know, dark times over there for Bioware and uh, the team working on Anthem. Yeah, it, it's rough. They've been moving people off of the project uh, to focus on other things. So I kind of think that it will be um, um, eliminated. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. That could be for the best. Who knows? But bummer for anyone who is a fan of that game. Uh, next, CDPR, CD Project Red has been hacked. You probably have read about this. Uh, it's uh, not a good situation over there all around. Just keeps getting worse. The source code and apparently some financial details were stolen, and uh, at least the source code was put on the kind of the internet black market and has apparently already been purchased on some auction. So uh, really not good stuff. Yeah, you just feel for uh, employees and even ex-employees that don't even work there anymore. Their information's out there because they were part there that was still, you know, within CDPR. So yeah, just hope for the best outcome and hope that the people doing this uh, get what's coming to them. <laughs> yeah. And I do like how CDPR was like, we are not going to mess with these people. Like, go ahead, yeah. do do what you're going to do with this information. You know, you got us. We're not going to uh, bow to your will and do what you want. Yeah, uh, a good move in um, a sea of bad moves for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, next, E3 came out, or the the ESA rather, came out and said that E3 will, uh, they are hoping to make E3 happen this year. I don't think this has been approved by the board over there, but they're proposing that they push forward with an, an all digital E3 event for 2021, which I think is an incredibly good move. Don't do it in person. Do it all <laughs> digital if you're going to do it. And um, hopefully it comes together. You know, it's going to look different, uh, I think, for uh, the next few years, if not forever. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. If this goes well, if this happens, then I'm I'm with you, Josh. I I don't really see why you'd want to hold it in person. Um, Speaking as someone who's been there, and I know you've been there, it's just gotten worse um, overall as an experience, at least in my opinion. Um, It takes forever to play games. You don't get to see a ton of stuff unless you have advanced access. So I really do hope this works. Yeah, me too. I do hope they they find something to do in person uh, for people who like, you know, my channel depends on the on the the content that comes out of events like E3 um, and and being able to play in person does make a huge difference. 
but um, yeah, I do think that whatever the the final product looks like in a year or two or three is gonna it's gonna be different than what we've what we've known. So totally uh, look f- look forward to uh, whatever they announce officially for that. And then lastly, uh, uh, some Mass Effect news came out, and Jackson, as always, I'm kicking this one over to you. Yeah, just a quick one here. I'm sure you guys have seen the controversy with Miranda's butt. Um, people yes. are up in arms about Bioware changing one scene. Um, and I just wanted to put a disclaimer out there. Uh, a lot of people are making a lot out of nothing here. Um, just as someone who's kind of seen the inside perspective here, Bioware is uh, making changes for the better of the game to, in terms of context, not content. Um, I think if this was really about Miranda's butt, they'd just change her model entirely. She's still going to be in the game. If that's what you play these games for, then uh, you you won't be disappointed. But <laughs> is still there. Um, but yeah, just sit, changing a few scenes because they didn't make sense. I don't think there's much to talk about there. Yeah, no, there's not. And you know, if you want to see butts, there are plenty <laughs> of butts on the internet. There are ways you can find even Miranda's butt. So... Yeah, there you go. You don't even have to play a couple hours of a video game. It's, nope. it's a lot closer than you think. Yeah. So uh, thanks for uh, going over that. Uh, the last thing we want to just briefly mention, uh, this is a, a rotating segment we've done once before. So this is the, tw- the second time we've done this trailer watch. There is a new trailer out that we think you all should see. It's for uh, Black Myth Wukong. This is the game, the game that's developed by a Chinese developer. And it came out a couple months ago with this spectacular gameplay demo. Well, there's a new trailer for it. It also looks spectacular. I mean, we're talking like some almost photorealistic graphics here. Uh, given the whole situation with Cyberpunk, I really hope they're not overselling this, but um, looks great so far. Yeah, what concerns me, I don't know if you saw, Josh, at the end of the trailer, it said that this is not representative of the plot whatsoever, and it was made for the Lunar New Year as the kind of an advertisement. So that, I yeah, yeah, I that kind that. of concerns me, um, I'll be honest, but... That doesn't mean that it's automatically not going to look like that. Um, yeah, I just yeah. think that's a weird thing to do personally. Yep. If this game ends up being terrible, these people definitely have a have a, a prosperous career in making trailers. Oh, yeah. They, they <laughs> certainly do. These have been awesome. Yeah. So uh, go check that out. It's on YouTube. Uh, and with that, we are going to take our first break. We'll be right back. And we're back. We are now going to get into our deep dive discussion of the week. And this week, we got a bunch of news about Ubisoft, which is very interesting. And all this came out of their earnings call, which uh, I have definitely read up on. I did not listen to it or read any transcripts, but I have definitely checked out the articles and lots of interesting stuff, not just the big headline that came out of this, which, um, in fact, maybe you disagree, Jackson, but the big news that I was uh, struck by was that Ubisoft seems like they're going to transition their focus away from AAA experiences in favor of uh, potentially free-to-play experiences and maybe even some uh, some titles that rely on their backlog or their back catalog, rather, of games. And now, this I don't think that they were saying that they're going to abandon AAA experiences by any stretch, but more make these three uh, um, equal pillars if you will, of their uh, offerings. So making AAA, at least AAA and free-to-play are going to kind of stand as equals as they move forward. I don't know if that's how you interpreted this. Uh, yeah, I, I did. I think you're cutting to the meat of it. Um, it it's expanding on live service um, across all their franchises, particularly with AAA, like literally transitioning every single kind of game that they put out uh, to live service. But then, yeah, it, it is strange that they said that they're going to focus more on on free to play. Considering, I don't know, is anyone talking about hyperscape? Um, no, or, like and, even they yeah. didn't on this call. Yeah, so it's it's, it's bizarre because I feel like stuff that they've tried hasn't worked um, in that area. So it's it's interesting. Yeah, and just to kind of add some context here, here's a quote that is from the call. This is from the CFO, the chief financial officer. His name is Frederick, and I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. I'm sure he's French. Uh, Duguet? Du, du, Duguet? I'm sure. It's- Sounds right to me. Yeah. Anyways, he said, quote, we said for a number of years that our normal template is one to come with either three or four AAA games. So we'll stick to that plan for fiscal 2022. But we see that we are progressively continuously moving from a model that used to be only focused on AAA releases to a model 
where we have a combination of strong releases from AAA and strong back catalog dynamics, but also complementing our program of new releases with free-to-play and other premium experiences. And there were definitely other quotes in there that uh, later on in the call that really talked about the uh, the free-to-play games. So, But they didn't really, as far as I could see, they didn't specify what that might be. So are they talking about experiences like uh, Hyperscape, which are designed from the ground up as free-to-play? The question that popped into my mind is, are they going to take some of their cert live service games like For Honor, maybe Rainbow Six Siege, even though that game is really successful, and do something like Destiny did, where Destiny, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but Destiny is now free to play, isn't it? Um, it, it, has a free to, it has a free to play version. Um, okay. You can go up to like level 20, but like none of the new content, the, the idea of that free to play is to goad you into spending money to, to continue on with that experience. Yeah, which they could is, do, you know, with yeah. some of their games. Yeah, I'm, t- I'm totally with you. It's the, the wording here is like obviously corporate speak. Um, so, so it's always kind of weird to cut the knife through this butter and, and find you know what they're actually saying mm-hmm. and what they actually mean. I think Ubisoft, um, one of their biggest strengths uh, undeniably is, is the back catalog. I, I think a lot of people go back and play um, Ubisoft games, uh, especially Assassin's Creed, which is just one of their biggest franchises, if not their biggest. For sure. Yeah, like you right now, you're playing, you know, even though <laughs> Origins isn't that far in their back catalog, it is. And I, with my fascination in stealth games, I've been thinking about going back to play Unity, which a lot of people nowadays say is one of the best old old school, I put that in air quotes, Assassin's Creed games out there. Yeah, you should. It's really good. Yeah. So uh, that was just a very interesting kind of, uh, I think it was a bit jarring to read that for some people, especially since Ubisoft has so heavily invested recently, at last in the last decade, really, in their AAA experiences. But I don't think those games are necessarily going anywhere. I think we'll still get Assassin's Creed. We'll still get Far Cry. We'll still get um, struggling to think of their other like big AAA non-live service games, but we'll get those games. Yeah, they're not going anywhere. They just expect them to be like um, the recent Assassin's Creed, so expect them to be live service with long content tales. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, so some other really interesting news we got that's maybe not as uh, indicative of any big changes coming forward, but uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is their biggest Assassin's Creed launch in history. Uh, I don't think that's a huge surprise with the daily average users are uh, are up two times compared to Odyssey in the same time frame. That is a bit of a surprise for me, actually. Yeah, um, their their engagement model is working. Um, so, don't expect any sweeping pay, uh, changes in the in the franchise. If you're a fan and you're thinking, "Man, I really wish it went back to the old way," just tuck that away. Honestly, I, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, I don't either. Uh, unless, I mean, this maybe we were maybe going to get into this later, but uh, and maybe we will. But unless maybe a remake is in order for some of these older Assassin's Creed games. Great point. I think that's the one way. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so next, Rainbow Six Siege has surpassed 70 million players, adding 15 million just last year. Those are gigantic numbers. Uh, really impressive. I mean, their support for this game is clearly paying off. Absolutely. And this is still shocking to me. I think it proves they have a very sound uh, framework with Siege. And it's very, um, what do you call it? Esports friendly. So. Yep. Um, I think that's another way that they're bolstering that audience and and that uh, player base. That's massive. Yeah. And again, their their talk of free to play games to me, I'm very curious to see if that free to play model somehow creeps its way into their bigger live service games. I I would like to see that. I I just I'm curious. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, So next, uh, Ubisoft says, uh, the switch to RPG mechanics with the Assassin's Creed franchise has led to a steep rise in engagement. I mean, I guess that's uh, indicative of what we just talked about with uh, Valhalla, um, but for Origins and Odyssey as well, uh, which all three, I think, broke records in terms of engagement. So again, uh, don't look for them to veer away from this long form RPG format if that's not your cup of tea. Yes, absolutely. They're going to keep doing it. Yeah. Um, so we've already covered some of the, uh, this other stuff. They're ramping up production of free to play games. And uh, they did cover their their kind of list of games that are on the slate for 2021 through maybe 2022. I, I Some of these games might creep into next year. Far Cry 6, that's definitely 2021. Rainbow Six Quarantine, they're saying, is going to release by September. Um, so we'll see about that. 
The one that I think is just up in the air, nobody knows, is Skull and Bones, but that game still is a thing. They're still working on it, and it is still going to come out. Uh, Riders Republic, that was supposed to come out this month. Now that's been delayed indefinitely. Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, I think that also recently received an indefinite re, uh, delay. So that's a bummer. But mm-hmm. I do believe they're going to be working. Hopefully they're going to be working on making this game just look better. It didn't look that great, in my opinion. Yeah, I don't think it did either. And then lastly is Roller Champions. I feel like they've been working on this one forever. Yeah, that's a weird one. I, I just I, I struggle to find the audience um, for that. Um, but yeah, Ubi's got some exciting projects. I mean, Far Cry is pr- a pretty big franchise. Um, we just got an update on Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed. Um, Skull and Bones, I actually played um, at E3 2018, and it felt good when I played it. So there must have been some kind of internal issue um, or somebody up top was not pleased with how it was looking at the time. So uh, it's so weird to me that we still haven't seen that game. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to recall the details, but there was a news story last year that came out where Skull and Bones did un- go undergo a pretty big overhaul, and it was in the vein of it becoming, I, I believe, definitely uh, either correct me if I'm wrong or if you if you really want to know the details, go look it up. But um, from uh, what I remember, Skull and Bones was going to be like this more dedicated single player experience. Then they changed it to like this live service game. And then I think after that, there was even more of a shakeup in just the structure of the game. So it's it's kind of doesn't sound promising, but yeah, the mechanics of the game I think are built based off AC4, which those you know, and and obviously the other Assassin's Creed games that have incorporated naval combat, which works great. I, it does, and that's exactly what it was when I played it three years ago or two and a yeah. half, I guess you could say. So um, yeah, keep your eyes out, guys. We'll keep you updated here. Yep. So that is all the stuff that they covered. They did. Uh, well, I guess they mentioned that they're working on an Assassin's Creed mobile game with Tencent. And so that could also be one of these free to play games. We'll see. And then no mention of either Hyperscape or Beyond Good and Evil 2, which I still am skeptical that that game will ever come out. Yeah, me neither. It's kind of like um, I know we already talked about it, but Splinter Cell, people hoping for a new Splinter Cell. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, especially with all this information. I mean, beyond good and evil, that could be they could turn that into some sort of RPG or some sort of long tail game with a ton of content. But Splinter Cell, I mean, that the the type of game that that is just does not fit with any of what they're talking about, uh, unfortunately, which especially me now getting into stealth games so heavily, it's like kind of stuck with what we've got. <laughs> I know it's, it's disappointing. Um, I don't think we'll go back to the old days of Splinter Cell. Um, and, and Ghost Recon kind of feels like the evolution, like they took that franchise and yep. borrowed some concepts from Splinter Cell and made it open world. But we saw how Breakpoint turned out. So yeah, it'll be interesting. Yep. So um, any just uh, more general impressions that you had, Jackson, on this news? Uh, uh yeah, um, I would say generally this is a bit disappointing. Um, obviously, financially it works for them, but um, I'm not everyone. Um, there's a very strong contingent of people that love the direction Assassin's Creed has gone in. Um, I think from a meta perspective, I'm not a huge fan of it, but um, I think what this means is that whatever the next Assassin's Creed is, whether those rumors recently that leaked about it being in India or... Um, or China or Japan or in Europe, it's going to be similar to what you guys have played recently. Um, it just is. And I think that's a reality we have to come to terms with. Um, but in terms of like making everything live service, I think that's also a little disappointing. Um, I think, again, it's it's a financial incentive, but does it produce a better game? I think you could ar- arguably say no, um, at least from my perspective. Yeah, it. I do think that Ubisoft latches on to what works as they should, but maybe a little too they're they're a little too reticent to change it once they do. I uh, I've we've seen that with Far Cry. I played Far Cry 3 and then I played Far Cry 4, which to me were way too similar. And then when when Far Cry 5 came out, I'm like, I don't want to do this all over again. Uh, so I skipped that altogether and I did almost the same with Valhalla. You know, I played Origins, loved it, played Odyssey, loved it, and then Valhalla came out and I got 20 hours in and I was just like yeah, this is not the same game, but I still feel like I've done this before for many, many hours. So I put it down and I wish they would. Uh, I wish they would. And I hope that they will with the next Assassin's Creed and Far Cry 6 add enough changes to the the formulas that they've got there that work that it f- somehow feels fresh for me. But if not, you know, I don't see myself playing 
Um, I'll probably play Far Cry 6, but the next Assassin's Creed, I'm not so sure. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 like bittersweet. I, I think just from a consumer perspective, it's like we don't really care. I mean, Ubisoft's financial <laughs> viability, like we still want those games, but you know, it's not like, oh, yay, we're rooting for Ubisoft, right? But yeah. Um, at the same time, it's it's a little rough to uh, just look at what we're getting right now and the fact that there's MTX and single player games like that still rubs me the wrong way. Um, actually, I don't know if you saw it, but I had a tweet that got a lot of traction um, the other day and we're, we're talking about free to play here. It would be interesting to see if they would take, like you mentioned, a big franchise like Assassin's Creed and make a free to play product and just pack it with microtransactions because that's how those free to play games work mm-hmm. anyways and and kind of leave that stuff out of their main triple A games. Now, I think that's like a rose colored glasses perspective, um, but I, I would like to see something like that so that the single player games, you know, kind of get that bump that they deserve. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. And just how many people potentially and not that there are that many people that haven't tried Assassin's Creed, but would there be any people who would who haven't because it's free? That'd be exactly. Um, I'd, be, so, I'd love to see it. Yeah. So like they did mention, you know, their their back catalog. That was something they touched on a number of times in this call. And it brought up the question, which I touched on, you know, which Assassin's Creed games. Now, they have released remasters, but which Assassin's Creed game or maybe other game in the in the Ubisoft back catalog? Would you like to see them either remaster or I think more interestingly, just totally remake from the ground up? Yeah, a lot of people talk about this, and the, and the one thing I see is uh, is Assassin's Creed One. People want them to go back and remake that because um, yeah. that's a it's just a very unique game. It's it's almost indistinguishable from what we have today, um, and it's almost indistinguishable from Assassin's Creed Two, if you can believe it. It's just it's on its own little island. Um, that's my personal pick, but I think the smart thing for Ubi to do would actually to go back and uh, remake Black Flag. I think that fits in with their new vision. Um, And then they would kind of uh, change it to fit um, more of the more, you know, modern conventions. Yeah, I love that setting, the Caribbean. Uh, It 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 actually, it's probably my second favorite Assassin's Creed that I've played. Um, And I would love, yeah, for them to, love to see what they would do with that. However, Assassin's Creed one is the one that I that's of all the mainline Assassin's Creed, like the numbered ones and then the new ones. That's the one that I've never played. So it'd okay. be interesting for me to dig into that and see what it's like, uh, that that era, that setting and the character. You know, I, I don't just don't know anything about him. Yeah, uh, it, he's he's awesome. I have a special love for AC one. Yeah. And but I do think they probably have to make some serious adjustments from what I remember. That game was it just wasn't very well received, at least not as well as Ubisoft had hoped. And I I remember. I think a lot of people said it was just really repetitive. They do. I disagree, though. I, th- I think it's it's great. Um, it, it, the rep- what what is repetitive is a very fun gameplay loop. It just just in my book, but I know I'm in the minority there. Yeah. So, anyways, that was all the stuff, the news, uh, and the information and the discussion we got out of that uh, that earnings call. Really interesting stuff. You know, Ubisoft. I know you're a big Ubisoft fan, as am I. And so uh, I definitely hope that we get some uh, really interesting stuff in the next year or two. I'm looking forward to Far Cry. I think that's probably the next big one on the horizon. Riders Republic looks interesting. So we'll see what we get from Ubisoft. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. So with that, we are going to take our second break. And when we get back, we're going to dig into our mailbag. We'll be right back. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us till the end of the show. We are now going to read one of your questions. You can write in at any time to preloaded at the email address preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. Definitely send us your questions. We read them all and we love discussing them here on the show. This week, we got a question from Ricardo. So Ricardo, thank you very much for writing in with the thoughtful question. Here's what you asked. God of War got a PS5 update enhancement for the PS5, basically putting it at 60 frames per second and almost native 4K. Do you guys think that most studios on the side of working of their new projects and IPs are going to enhance their previous released games for PS5 and Xbox Series X? Could we see Horizon Zero Dawn enhancements or for the Xbox Series X, all Gears of War games running at a higher frame rate? So Jackson, what do you think? 
Uh, first off, great question, Ricardo. That's This is something I often wonder about, and I actually hold off replaying games um, because I think, oh, is Red Dead Redemption 2 going to get an upgrade? Like, I would like to wait for that. Um, so to answer your question, I think if a studio is big enough and they have the resources, then yes. Um, this is not something we should expect across the board, though, for every single game. Um, the weird one, though, and I'm glad you brought it up, is Horizon Zero Dawn. I, I don't think, actually, I don't think we ever will because the way that game was made, and we've seen lots of um, kind of news coverage about this, is that it's hard for them to increase the frame rate because so much of what they made was tied to 30. So um, obviously they had to break that down and rebuild it for the sequel that we're going to see hopefully this year. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, I I'd like to see more studios do this. I just don't think we'll see it across the board. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot of this. Um, what I'm disappointed to see is, so, well, I guess what we'll start with what I'm happy to see is, is developers like Sony Santa Monica and even CDPR, you know, say what you will about them recently, but they they really committed to a free upgrade for um, Cyberpunk and the God of War up, update is free. And there are other developers doing this and that's great. But what I'm disappointed to see is there are a lot of developers that are still, you know, doing their upgrade and then charging for it, not only charging, but charging a lot. You know, we saw this with Control where they released the Ultimate Edition. And in order to play the up-res or whatever you want to call it, the, the, the updated version for next gen, you have to buy that whole... Um, uh, experience. Now you did get it for free if you have PlayStation Plus, which is great. But if you are on like Xbox, for example, you just have to buy that version for I think 50, 40 or fifty dollars. Then we saw Neo do this recently with their Neo collection, which it's awesome that they made this collection. It's like a complete collection with all the content and it's um remastered for both Neo 1 and Neo 2. But if you want those remastered versions, you either have to buy them piecemeal at 50 bucks a pop or you have to buy the collection at $70. So yeah. like that's a bit disappointing to see or what NBA 2K, you know, in order to get that up, uh, uh, improved version, you had to buy the um, the hundred dollar version, I think, for PS4, if I remember the one with Kobe Bryant on the cover. Not right. entirely sure about that. But anyways, point being, there's definitely some cash grabbing going on with this. Totally. You bring up such a good point. And to Ricardo's question, all the Gears of War games running at higher frame rates expect to pay for that. I would not ever like expect them to to give that out. I, I think this is limited to games that have come out relatively recently that will get these free upgrades. Yeah, yeah. So although with you know Xbox first party games, there is Game Pass, so at least there's that. But right. But yeah, uh, I think developers will do this. Just will they uh, make them free or will they charge for them? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, time will tell. Yeah. So uh, again, thanks for the question. If you want to uh, have your question discussed on the show, again, it's preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And that is going to do it for this week. Uh, again, thanks for listening through to the end of the show. We've loved having you join us. Uh, if you are listening on any of the audio platforms, definitely uh, don't forget to drop us a review if you're enjoying the show. Uh, and with that, Jackson, is there anything uh, you want to plug on your channel before we sign off? Yes, I did a, like a 2021 review of uh, Black Flag, um, really special kind of passion project for me because I love the game. So yeah, go check that out. It's up, it's up live now. Awesome. And I just posted this morning, so it'll have been up a day when you're listening to this, my uh, preview of Returnal. I cover 12 cool gameplay details. Uh, I think that game deserves more love than it's getting. So definitely go check that out. And uh, we'll look forward to us uh, or I'll look forward to seeing you over on my channel. Um, if you are watching this on either of our YouTube channels, don't forget to drop a comment. Uh, we love engaging with you there as well. And with that, we are going to sign off. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys.